that's in the plasma. If we come over and look at CO2, again this is a red blood cell, and about, and about 23 percent of carbon dioxide is transported on hemoglobin. About 7 percent is transported in plasma. This takes us back to Henry's law and Dalton's law that tells us that carbon dioxide is better at dissolving into solution. So there's more carbon dioxide in the solution. In fact, it would dissolve so well that we actually need another way to capture it, and we capture it in something called carbonic acid. So we capture CO2 in carbonic acid. Another reason we do this is because it actually competes with oxygen for hemoglobin. In order to expand on that a little bit further, let's go back up here to oxygen carbon dioxide transport and go through how hemoglobin knows when to drop off oxygen. Hemoglobin is absolutely brilliant at knowing when to drop off oxygen. Real simply, hemoglobin wants to drop off oxygen when the tissue is doing some sort of work or when it's metabolizing. There's some signals that are put off when tissue is working. For example, if tissue works, it generally creates heat, so there's an increase in temperature. As hemoglobin warms up, its affinity for oxygen decreases. Another less technical way to say that is hemoglobin likes oxygen less. So oxygen is dropped off and the tissue is nourished by that extra oxygen. Another effect of work in tissue is metabolites are increased. One of the main metabolites that affects hemoglobin is something called BPG. So if BPG goes up, hemoglobin likes oxygen less, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen decreases, and so we drop off oxygen. And that oxygen will nourish the tissue that's doing work. Tissue that's working will also increase its acid. Metabolism creates protons, and that increases the acidity or decreases the pH. As pH decreases around hemoglobin, its affinity for oxygen decreases, which means it's going to drop off that oxygen and the tissue will be nourished. The last one is pretty interesting. It's called the Haldane effect. And essentially it means that oxygen and carbon dioxide will compete for hemoglobin. So it's called the Haldane effect. And it means that if there's work, we increase CO2. And that CO2 is going to compete with hemoglobin. It's literally going to kick off oxygen. It's going to kick the oxygen off the hemoglobin. O2 is dropped off and the tissue is nourished. So if the tissue is metabolizing, it'll make more CO2. The higher concentration of CO2 will compete with hemoglobin for oxygen, meaning it's going to kick that oxygen off the hemoglobin. This means the CO2 is going to be transported back to the lungs, but when it gets back to the lungs, there's going to be an increased concentration of oxygen. So now oxygen will kick CO2 off the hemoglobin. CO2 will be exhaled and oxygen will be bound for transport out to the tissue. Now this Haldane effect also points out why down here we need to have a way to have hemoglobin protected from this extra CO2. So this Haldane effect also points out a reason why we need to kind of sequester CO2. We need to protect it from having access to hemoglobin so it can't constantly kick oxygen off of hemoglobin. So we sequester it as something called carbonic acid which is H2CO3. This means we can carry the CO2 in the red blood cell back to the lungs and it's not going to kick the oxygen off the hemoglobin. That then is interesting if we look at this graph because this graph points out that hemoglobin is very good at carrying oxygen. It generally doesn't like to give up oxygen unless it really has to. So the fact that we protect the hemoglobin that's carrying oxygen from the Haldane effect and CO2 means that hemoglobin can carry that oxygen and not give it up unless absolutely required. What this graph is actually showing you across the x-axis is the concentration of oxygen in two main places, tissue and lungs. And this unit would be in millimeters of mercury. So in the tissue, the oxygen is about 45 millimeters of mercury. That's the partial pressure. And in the lungs, it's about 100 millimeters of mercury. Going up the y-axis, I have the very saturations of hemoglobin from unsaturated, three partially saturated, so saturated with one, two, three oxygen molecules. And then we have fully saturated hemoglobin that has four oxygen molecules. The place I'd like to start here is in the lungs. In the lungs, hemoglobin is 100% loaded. So all of the hemoglobin is going to leave the lungs with four oxygens. If we drop down to the partial pressure in tissue, we come over here and we look at our hemoglobin still has three molecules of oxygen. This tells us that when oxygen leaves the lungs, it has four molecules of oxygen. When it hits the tissue, it's got three. It's going to return to the lungs with three molecules of oxygen still. That means a hemoglobin will drop off one oxygen in one circulation. So even after it leaves the lungs, goes out to the tissue, it's going to come back with three oxygen. That's a huge buffer in terms of oxygen loading. One of the consequences of that is that's why in recent years, people have been hesitant to do CPR because they're hesitant about the mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. But now the current technique involves no ventilation. And that's a recognition that this hemoglobin is going to still carry plenty of oxygen. So if you can just circulate that blood, the hemoglobin still has this huge buffer of oxygen.
Another way you might understand this or might recognize this is when we talk about O2 saturation. So you put the little red light on the finger and it tells you how much oxygen is in the blood. A bad number is anything in the low 90s. Below 90 is not a good saturation. A good number is in the high 90s. And again, that's because hemoglobin is almost always full of oxygen. It only drops it off when absolutely necessary. It reminds me of swimming, too, when I had a swim coach that would tell me to hyperventilate before you raced because you really, really wanted to load up on oxygen, and that is not a valid technique. Actually, what that does is gets rid of your CO2, so it holds on. It makes you breathe less, so it holds you off from breathing because you're losing your signal to breathe, but you're actually not loading up any more oxygen. One last example is you may have heard of canned oxygen or oxygen bars, and those are completely worthless because hemoglobin that's already leaving the lungs is already 100% filled. So putting more oxygen in your lungs, unless you've got some severe medical condition, is not going to help a hemoglobin load up with any more oxygen. Our last step then is cellular respiration. We breathe in this oxygen. It goes through all these steps to get to the mitochondria, where it's vital for cellular metabolism. Now I should point out that a lot of oxygen is thought to be used by peroxisomes, and that's not really known what's going on there. So we generally think that most of this oxygen is going through the mitochondria or it's playing a role in cellular metabolism. Without going into the details of cellular metabolism all over again, we're just going to point out that oxygen is combined with carbon in Krebs cycle. So you've got these carbon molecules that you're going to break off from glucose, and you need to combine them with oxygen to get rid of it. The other thing you're going to do, when you broke those carbons off the glucose, what you really wanted was the protons, the hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions are going to be separated, so when you recombine them with oxygen in the electron transport chain, you make water. So you pull these hydrogens off of glucose, you group them all up, you let them combine with water, and in the process of finding that oxygen, making water, you get a lot of ATP out of the process. So this is ultimately where the oxygen is going. Both turned into CO2 when we capture the carbons from glucose, and turned into H2O when we capture the hydrogens from this glucose. Well, that really almost wraps it up. The main thing that we want to do is we want to get oxygen into the lungs and down to the mitochondria. So we've got to have ventilation where we get air into the lungs. We've got to have external respiration where we get that oxygen or that air into the blood. Hemoglobin will transport it through the vessels. We'll get it back out of the vessels and back off hemoglobin in internal respiration, and then we have cellular respiration. So if I can go up to the top right of this figure, one other way to really make sure that you understand this material is to think of pathologies that affect the individual steps in respiration. So find some respiratory pathologies like CF, asthma, COPD, ARDS, diabetes, smoke inhalation, CO poisoning, any of these things, and determine which steps in respiration would be affected. Most pathologies are going to affect multiple steps directly, and then I'll affect all steps indirectly through CO2. As an example, I put emphysema on here. Emphysema is going to affect both ventilation and external respiration. It's going to affect ventilation because it's going to be difficult to decrease the volume. What happens in emphysema is the tiny little alveoli break into larger alveoli. This removes some of the elasticity of the lung, and so that makes it difficult to decrease the volume, increase pressure, and breathe out. In addition to that effect, it also decreases the surface area. We talked about here in external respiration. Decreases the surface area where oxygen can make it into the capillary, and that's going to decrease external respiration. That's going to cause an increase in CO2 and a buildup of air in the lungs. It often causes something called a barrel chest, and that means you're going to have more CO2, and technically that would affect all the other steps in respiration as well because you're going to have increased CO2, which will affect carbon dioxide transport. It's going to knock more oxygen off the hemoglobin. It's just going to increase the amount of CO2 in internal respiration. There might be more CO2 being delivered to the tissue, actually, because we've built up CO2 in the lungs. And you're also, technically speaking, going to, through the law of mass action, slow down this reaction. If there's more CO2, that means there's more products of this reaction, and technically that will slow down this reaction by the law of mass action in chemistry, which basically says if you've got something that's being converted into something else, if you have a lot of what's being converted into, it's going to slow down the whole reaction. You can find many other pathologies and line these up, perhaps even write them in these boxes. So there's mitochondrial disorders, CO poisoning, or even smoking means you're going to deliver carbon dioxide to the tissue. You can have sickle cell anemia or thalassemia that's going to affect hemoglobin, which means it's going to affect oxygen, carbon dioxide transport. Again, you can have the flu or something that causes a mucus buildup in the lungs, and that makes it harder for external respiration. That might decrease your oxygen transport into the blood, and that will contribute to fatigue since you have less oxygen available. So I think one of the best ways to make sure that you understand all these steps in respiration is to point out pathologies that affect each of the steps in respiration, and note when those pathologies affect multiple steps in respiration. Thank you.